everyone. Uh, my name is Claire Evans. I'm Jonna Bechtolt, and together we co-author an entity called Yacht, based in Los Angeles, California. Yacht is a band. That's what we're known for, and that's why we're here. But we see being a public entity as an opportunity to create weird and interesting on- and off-screen experiences for many different people in many different mediums and on many different scales. Yeah, here's a quick collage of some of the things that we've made. These objects range from traditional band souvenirs like cassette tapes, merchandise pins, kiss cut sticker sheets, and iPhone case, to more esoteric projects like a line of sunglasses. That actually they came out today, which is awesome for us. <laughs> um, a laptop sleeve, which was designed to look like a manila envelope, which we created when the original MacBook Air was unveiled in 2008 and Steve Jobs pulled it out of a manila envelope, of course. Or finally, a free iPhone app called Five Every Day, which gives its users five interesting things to do in the city of Los Angeles every day that we select and write about. As a band, however, <laughs> um, we've been releasing albums, singles, and compilations on CD, cassette, vinyl, and digital formats since 2002 on literally every scale. Yeah, from self-made CDRs, printed risograph style on just paper. <laughs> to albums with elaborate global packaging and, uh, and global reach. We really love to experiment with format and distribution. For example, last year, we recorded a song called Party at the NSA, which was a protest song against the unwarranted government surveillance of private citizens. But we know that uh, in the 21st century, a protest song can't really just be music. So we designed a Party at the NSA fundraising campaign, selling the song online in exchange for donations to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, who as you may know, litigate on behalf of the public interest against the US government and the corporations that collude with it to invade the privacy of innocent citizens. After we were invited to perform Party at the NSA on the Capitol steps during Stop Watching Us, the largest anti-surveillance rally to date, this project evolved from just being a digital experiment to a very real world protest. The way that we see it, it's one thing to create text, design, and music that engages people online, but it's a lot more fun to bring those experiences into the world. As musicians, our bread and butter is live performance, so forging offline connections with people in the real world is really important to us. As you may know, in the creative field, one of the questions you get in interviews and just from people is, yeah, what is your inspiration? <laughs> Which, when it's directed towards musician, we think means something more like, where does a song begin? Like, what is the seed of a song? And it can seem kind of miraculous when you listen to music to imagine that a song could emerge from nothing. But it doesn't, of course. Uh, like any form of art, a song is like a snowball. It doesn't emerge into the world fully formed. It begins as something small, even inconsequential. The real work is in rolling that tiny pebble down the hill through the world, gathering weight and substance as you go along. In our minds, this, this is, is a process. Yeah, it can go on forever. Forever. And it's really about finding the right place to stop. Let us give you an example. So in August of last year, we started making a new song, and I started with just a bass line. history, a cool bass line has really been the foundation of a good song, we think. <laughs> For us, at least. <laughs> we want to talk to you about the process, though, that transforms something as simple as a bass line into a song and then to something much bigger than a song. But let's go back to the bass line. We sat with it for a while, but we knew that we needed a hook. So I rifled through my notebooks, and I found a line that I'd literally scribbled in the margins. Where does this disc go? It was actually a lyric that I misheard in a different th song, but we thought it was funny and humor is important. So we laid down a scratch vocal. Where does this disco? A rock roll, a disco. Where does this disco? A rock roll, a disco. It clicked immediately into that bass line. And as we looped this hook and listened to it over and over again in our studio, it began to evoke a very specific interest for us the decaying role of physical media in the buying and selling of music. We began to think about those boxes and boxes of CDs and vinyl LPs that hitch a ride with us around the world on tour. When the compact disc was first commercially introduced in the early 80s, it was marketed as a more durable, more portable, and higher fidelity alternative to the vinyl record. 
advertisements produced by Sony and Philips, who created the technology in tandem, extolled the virtue of the laser playhead, which wouldn't damage the CD the way that a needle wears into the grooves of a record. It was even called unbreakable. Yeah, and one of the original marketing taglines was pure, perfect sound forever. <laughs> the CD is inherently futuristic, or future-proof, as we were told. But, of course, as we all know, that's not true. For one, technology eventually outpaced the allegedly perfect fidelity of the CD format. And compact discs themselves are very delicate objects, easily marred by scratches and smudges. A little over 30 years after it was released, the compact disc now exists in a very strange and precarious position. It remains the most commercial medium for the buying and selling of music. In Japan, 85% of music is still purchased on compact disc. And yet, despite that ubiquity, it feels obsolete. There's really no cultural cachet for CD collectors. Of course, this is a subjective assessment, but it feels really true to our experience. As we design and sell plenty of CDs of our own music, but it's probably been 10 years since I bought a CD. We very rarely buy them for ourselves. Like a lot of consumers, we've switched to streaming services, which are devaluing music to its lowest point in history. Instead of $10 for a piece of plastic containing a dozen songs, we now pay $10 a month for access to nearly every song ever recorded. The advantage is so great that it has converted us, whose work it may or may not devalue, which doesn't really bode well for the compact disc. For a lot of people, a CD is no longer an object of value in of itself. It's more like a place where digital music is temporarily imprisoned. Once the songs are freed and encoded to the cloud, the CD itself becomes nothing more than an empty vessel, no better than a coaster. All of this is to say, we started writing a song about compact discs. Not, <laughs> not literally about compact discs, but using that metaphor of the simultaneous ubiquity and obsolescence of the compact disc and physical media itself to talk about something else that toes the line between existence and non-existence. Love. <laughs> Love. And so with those parameters in place, the rest of the lyrics came really easily. We thought about loops, erasure, spinning, and reflections. But before we were anywhere near finishing the song, we began designing the physical release and its accompanying materials. We often consider how a song will look before we're even done settled on how it sounds. The process of design and composition inform one another. Making a CD about CDs in a landscape where CDs are growing obsolete was a really interesting design challenge for us. The logo was easy, obviously. Since the title of a song is a pun, we thought a visual pun would be cheap, but appropriate. But what about the thing itself? How do we turn this mundane object into a desirable, even beautiful thing? Selling physical copies of music is not an impossible pursuit. As you may know, there's been a huge resurgence in the popularity of vinyl. In an age of intangible media, people really respond to the tactility of records. We sell far more vinyl than CDs at our shows. And that even more maligned medium, the cassette tape, has actually hit a nerve with a lot of DIY artists and labels looking to find cheap ways to copy and distribute music. As of 2012, the indie cassette label Burger Records had sold 100,000 tapes. <coughs> Perhaps the CD could experience a similar revival in coming generations, becoming a fetish object for people far enough removed from the technology's initial dominance to find it retro or kitsch. <laughs> so with this in mind, when we set out to design the physical packaging for Where Does This Disco, we started by searching for rare and interesting varieties of compact disc in the wild. What's known as a Minimax fan disc or clear edge disc caught our eyes. It's a three inch disc suspended in a normal size clear platter, used a lot in promotional materials in the 90s. We saw these discs as a perfect opportunity for another visual joke. Um, so we designed the CD to look like a tiny vinyl LP being pulled out of a white label sleeve the kind of sleeve popularized by dance music and now more infamously by the digital artwork for the new U2 album that nobody seemed to want. <laughs> <laughs> we got really, really into the details. So this tiny strip on the yeah. inner ring of a CD is called a mirror band, and it's usually etched with the name of the manufacturer and serial numbers or barcodes associated with the product. But we saw it as another fragment of compact disc arcana and the ideal spot to hide a secret message. Yeah. Mm. The compact disc is dead, long live the compact disc. <laughs> we worked really closely with the manufacturer during this process, and we learned a lot. We've really discovered that we didn't know very much at all about how CDs are made. As it turns out, like most things, if you scrutinize it enough, this seemingly mundane object comes from a really beautiful and interesting process. So every mass-produced CD 
begins with something called a glass master, a round plate of glass containing the disk's master data. A glass master is only used in the manufacturing process and is usually destroyed or stored after the CDs are printed. But we thought it was such an interesting object that we convinced the manufacturer to make us an extra glass master. It's really nice of them to do that. <laughs> this is the where does this disco glass master. It's a process object, if you will, brought out from the shadows. We also learned that the foil coating on the back of a CD doesn't store any data. It's actually just there to reflect the light back to the laser playhead, allowing the data to be read on the disc. The music is in the plastic. And so we entreated that sweet, long-suffering manufacturing plant to create a run of CDs without their mirrored foil, a clear, unplayable disc containing the entirety of our musical catalog. <laughs> in a sense, this useless object <laughs> allows the CD to retain a kind of integrity. There's no way to listen to the songs etched onto it, but there's also no way that we know of to release those digital files from their prison. We really hope that fans go to the effort of proving us wrong. And some have said they will. Yeah. <laughs> then we descended into a vortex of CD obsession. So we commissioned the building of two four-foot CDs from acrylic and iridescent foil to use as stage props from our tour, or it's kind of our take on disco balls. We designed tour t-shirts with iridescent foil discs. And we built a website, a single-serving website for the tour. The URL is naturally where does this disco dot today. <laughs> the biggest challenge of this project has been designing an experience that suggests that a CD might still be a desirable object, even an art object. But part of what determines a piece of art's value is its limited accessibility, what the cultural critic Walter Benjamin called its aura, its very specific location in space and time. But CDs are, by definition, mass-produced objects. Every CD is a mechanical reproduction of the original recording. That said, there are still ways to make these reproductions feel like they have an aura of specialness by orchestrating an experience surrounding their consumption. So, on this tour that we've been on, at the merch table, we make fans believe that this Where Does This Disco CD package, which we produced in an edition of 500, is the only medium by which the songs can be experienced. Of course, it's ultimately a losing battle. We know that fans will eventually rip these songs off the discs and play them on their most accessible devices. But the game is in the experience, so we created a run of carbonless copy NDAs uh, which demand that merch buying concert attendees promise under penalty of law to keep a secret before they can purchase the CD itself. <laughs> the effect is completed by signs pasted all around the venue, which um, <laughs> express that a secret is being disseminated on the premises and that attendees' presence binds them legally in the keeping of this secret. A dummy CCTV camera and signs add to the mood. This is actually from the merch table in New York. Yeah. Um, you can buy these on Amazon, they're like 20 bucks, amazing. Um, admittedly, this is an extreme and largely symbolic way of countering the growing obsolescence of physical media in our industry. But the question which became interesting to us over the course of this project was, could we use a song and its accompanying multimedia treatment to suggest preemptive nostalgia for the compact disc? And by suggesting that nostalgia, could we modify people's perceptions of where these objects and their makers exist on the continuum of technological history? The thing is that we have a lot in common with compact discs. Where does music live? Does it live in an encoded file of a song? Or does it live in those performances of those songs in a live setting? Or somewhere in between in some kind of abstract, ineffable space where the idea of music exists? In any of these cases, we're just a couple of physical containers that serve to transmit ideas from creator to consumer, from cloud to cloud. As artists and as people, we're no more future-proof than a foil-plated compact disc. We're hyper-aware of this, which is why this Baroque journey into the medium of a CD has been so fascinating for us. It's been a way for us to explore our own limitations, to punch against the entropy of our work, and to have some fun in the process. We've made a point in the 12 years that this band has existed to perpetually extend the boundaries of what we do with design experiments like this one. Yacht is not just music, it's text, design, video, and above all, ideas. This keeps us from becoming bored, foremost, and from settling into predictable patterns of creativity. It's what keeps Yacht alive. So to return to that original question. Where does the song begin? Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As it turns out, that's not the interesting question to us. It's rather where the song ends that's interesting. As a piece of information, music is finite. There are opening notes and final notes. 
there is a file size. But if a song can speak to a moment in time, to a subcultural trend, to a shared or manufactured nostalgia, then its boundaries can be expanded dramatically. It can grow beyond a temporal existence and beyond a crummy plastic jewel case. So where does it end? If you think of a song as something more than music, if you think of a song as a point of departure for a process of design, that it never has to end at all. Thank you.